This is what we call the Golden Dome. This is the city of Jerusalem. And this part inside the wall, down here you see the wall coming around. You see where the laser is right here on the right hand side? That's the eastern gate. So this is the wall going up in this area. And this is called the Temple Mount or Mount Zion. It is referred to as this area right here in the back. This is Mount Moriah, Mount Zion in here. Now you see this little dip, this little valley? That's the Kidron Valley, okay? And then these tombs, we're, this picture we're standing on, uh, Mount of Olives, okay? Mount of Olives, the Mount of Olives Slope, Garden of Gethsemane, Kidron Valley, the old walls of Jerusalem, Eastern Gate, and then the Temple Mount platform, Mount Moriah, Mount Zion. Now, that's the geography of where this 134th Psalm is talking about. And God's saying in this Psalm, I'm going to bless you from Jerusalem. Now go to the next slide if you would please. <clears throat> On the southern steps, uh, back up one more time. I forgot to mention something, if you don't mind. Back up one slide. Uh, you, this is the eastern gate. Obviously, this is the eastern side. Now, look around here. You see this white area? This is called the southern steps. Over here off the screen is what we call the city of David. Down in here, the old Jebusite city. And then up here is the southern steps. And these would go right through that gate into the Temple Mount platform. And then in the time of Christ, uh, there would be a beautiful uh, second temple right there. Okay? I, I didn't want to forget those southern steps. Now, let's go to the next slide. We go to the next slide, and here are the southern steps. Now, these steps go up, and then you'll see where the gates are. You see they've uh, blocked them in. When the Ottoman Turks were there, they blocked all this in. But notice with me that the steps are not even. A narrow step, a long step, an even more narrow step, a little longer step, a narrow step, a long, and all the way up. And the reason is that if I'm going up to worship God... I don't want to be at routine or callous that I'll think about where I'm going. I'll have to watch my step. If they're all the same size, same height, I can just jog up the steps and I'm going up to, to church. I'm going up to worship. But they had them different sizes and heights that you had to stop and you had to think. And so these are called the steps of degree. They begin in Psalms 120. Now watch my hand. 120, 121, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32. When I get to Psalms 33, I'm supposed to be going through this gate right here. I am to recite these psalms, sing them, pray them, going up into the temple. And you see up here, you see how those steps go up? And then this is where the gate was. And when you get into that gate, you're supposed to be at the 133rd psalm. All right? Let's hold that picture a minute. Let's back up to Psalms 133. <clears throat> Behold how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. We're going to church. We're supposed to be in one mind, one accord. We're going in. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his garments. Isn't that great? All right, hold your finger there. Back up to Psalms 120. I'm getting ready to go to church. This is the first psalm. Uh, if you have a Schofield Bible uh, in your hand, 
right above uh, the 120 Psalm, right before it starts the text, it'll say a song of degrees. How many of you have that written in your Bible? So they're telling you that this is the Hebrew 15 Psalms that were to be sung on these steps going up, the degrees, all right? And then it says, Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. All right, then look at 121. I will lift mine eyes into the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord. All right, 122. I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go unto the house of the Lord. Do you see what we're doing? You follow that? Isn't that good? I mean, we don't have time to do all 15 of them, but I just wanted to whet your appetite. That's something you can do when you're on the porch with a cup of coffee and, the, and your Bible and you just want to meditate and read and think about what they were doing. And then in Psalms 123, Unto thee I lift mine eyes, O thou that dwellest in the heavens. Well, guess what? If I'm going up the steps, what am I looking at? I'm looking up. I'm looking up to the heavens, okay? Uh, and look at 124. If it had not been for the Lord who was on our side, See, I've got to have the Lord on my side. Then 125, they that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be moved. Well, I'm climbing, I'm climbing up Mount Moriah. Right here is Mount Zion to my left. And you, oh, you can't move that. So there's the reassurance from God is, you're all right. I'm going to take care of you. 126, uh, when the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, of Jerusalem. We were like them that dream. 127, look at what God's saying about the temple. Except the Lord build the house. They labor in vain that build it. Isn't that good? So I want you to enjoy that all the way through. So when you got to the gate, you were to be at 133. Now, when you go through the gate and get there on the temple mount, uh, you would be at Psalms 134. Okay, now let's read it again, and I want you to read it with me, all right? Let's read it together. Ready? Behold, bless ye the Lord, all ye servants of the Lord, which by night stand in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary. Bless the Lord, the Lord that made heaven and earth. Bless thee out of Zion. Isn't that good? Now, this is, like I said, the psalm of degrees. I want to back up to this first word, behold. Behold. Uh, this, in the Hebrew, this word behold, here in this particular chapter, is like the Greek, has multiple meanings, or what we call shades of color to descriptive passages. So, in the Hebrew, this word behold means amazement. You could say, what an amazement I'm having looking at the temple. I'm going up to the house of God. I stand amazed. It also means to look wide-eyed. What would you think if you were walking up those steps, look through that gate, and you saw the most beautiful building in the world trimmed in gold and silver, and over it, the Shekinah glory, 24 hours a day. The presence of God. I'd be wide-eyed too, brother. I'm telling you. And then, this is one of my favorite. It says, to be slack-jawed with an open mouth. Bugs can fly right in. Because I am, an, I am amazed at what I'm seeing. Uh, and then the fourth definition they had it meant to catch your breath. It was like, I can't believe. I can't believe I'm here. I can't believe God allowed me to get this close. I can't believe I can see His glory. I can't believe I can see all that. That's that one word, behold, in the first part of Psalms 134. Now, uh, the height of degrees is this. It's in three parts here. In verse 1, bless ye the Lord. In verse 2, bless the Lord. And in verse 3, the Lord that made heaven and earth bless thee. 
So if you're making Bible study notes tonight, there are two divisions in Psalms 134. First division is my responsibility. My responsibility. That's division one. What, are my, what is my responsibility? Or I guess we could say our responsibility. Your responsibility, my responsibility. <coughs> Excuse me. Verse 3 is, if verses 1 and 2 are our responsibility, verse 3 is God's response or God's responsibility to our action. So we get God's response. And here is the critical part that I wanted you to take home with you tonight. I want to talk to you about serving God in the night. Serving God in the night. How many times have we all read this and we've never paid any attention to the phraseology inside Psalms 134? But notice what God's doing. He said, Behold, bless ye the Lord, all you servants of the Lord. Here it comes. Which, I've got it circled now, by night stand in the house of the Lord. During the daytime, this is one of the most exciting places in the world. It's the Temple Mount. And the temple is full of people and it's busy. But here at night, this is a night, a modern night picture, and you see the city lights, but it looks altogether different than the daytime picture we saw. Take away electricity, and what would you see? You'd see darkness. Exactly right. You'd see darkness. Because the only light that would be at the Temple Mount would be the light of a candle or the light of a lantern. There's, there's no big spotlight. There's no, there's no uh, city lights. There's no uh, uh, roadway lighting. That's not there. So the best I could give you to even give you an idea is a night picture. So this is Jerusalem at night, far different from the one we just saw at the day. But if you cut off the electricity... What would we have up there? We'd have a black screen. It'd be, there would be no image because it would be totally dark. Now in the daytime, uh, there's a lot of people on the Temple Mount. In the daytime, it's a beehive of activity. Sacrifices are taking place. The massive choir is singing. And you know, we get a choir on Sunday. They got the choir every day. I mean, they had every day the instruments. They had the choir and it was going on. And then you had the constant flow of parents coming to dedicate their babies. Now, they do baby dedication a little differently under the law. Their baby dedication is on day 40. So on the 40th day, they would bring the baby there. Uh, and then on Mondays, they would do the bar mitzvahs for the, the young men. So the Temple Mount was a constant beehive of activity. Now, let's talk about the temple proper. According to the rabbis that write about these things and did the research, uh, there's approximately 600 employees inside the temple. So you've got the priest, the high priest. You've got the captain of the temple. You've got the Levites, the musicians. And so on an everyday basis, there's 600 people that are employed there, not counting the hundreds and thousands thousands that are constantly coming up on the Temple Mount. But at nighttime, what happens? All the activity's gone. They didn't have electricity. They could not illuminate the Temple Mount. So the only people that were there were the people, whew, Lord of God, that served him at night. The people that worked in the dark. And you know what they had every night? They had, listen to this, they had 22 people, 22 Levites that worked every night on that Temple Mount. Number 22, the number of light. 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet representing the Word of God. 22 Levites that worked. In addition to that, we had three other people. We had the captain of the guard. We had him working there. 
And <clears throat> at the same time, we had these 22, and we had the one temple guard, and we had two priests. So we got one temple guard, two priests, and 22 Levites, and they work, and they serve the Lord through the night. I'd like to think about that temple guard being a prayer warrior that prayed all night long for those that are working. Uh, that was somebody that kept talking to the Lord and kept praying unto the Lord. And uh, the Levite tribe, obviously, is the one that had the responsibility with keeping and caring for the temple. And with the exception of these 22 Levites that were there, there was nobody there. It was deserted. And it was quiet, and it was dark, and there are no big lights, and the only light you're going to see on the temple mount is if one of those Levites comes out and he's got a candle or he's got a lantern. And what are they doing? They're getting ready for the next day. They're serving at night so that the masses can serve him in the day. And somebody's burning the midnight oil so that the place will be ready for the presence and the power of God during the daytime. And and when you begin to realize this, uh, how many of us realize that the stars shine 24 hours a day? The stars are up there. They don't go anywhere. They're up there. But when the big sun comes out, we don't see the stars, but they're there. But we do appreciate them at night when the sun's on the other side of the earth and it's totally dark out there and you can't see your hand in front of your face, then all of a sudden there's comfort with the light. But you know what they tell me? They tell me that if you're one of these guys that work in these big oil uh, storage tanks or big water storage tanks, or that you were one that worked and repaired whales, that on a noonday that you could go down in that well and you could go down deep enough in a mine shaft of that well and if you had a view of the heavens that you could see the stars in the daytime because you are in the dark. And listen, God knows where you are. God knows what you're walking through. God knows what you're facing. God knows what well you're in. God knows what you feel like you're in a hole and there's no way out. But if you look up out of that darkness you'll see that the stars of the authority of God are still shining, Patsy. They're still there. God hadn't gone anywhere. Heaven hadn't gone anywhere. God the Father's still on the throne. And Jesus, the Son of God, is still there. And the Holy Ghost is still working. Nothing's changed. But you can't see it with all the clutter and all the business of the day. But during the night, sometimes God wants me to serve him in the night. You don't always understand what's happening in the night. It's hard to get the big picture in the night. It's hard to see past the little light of your candle or the larger light of your lantern. It's hard to see the whole temple mount. It's hard to see the beginning and the end. It's hard to see when you're looking through a glass darkly. But God said, if you'll just keep on being faithful, and if you'll just serve me in the night, he said, I'm going to show you things and I'm going to teach you things in the dark. You'll go to school in the dark and you'll learn things that you'll never learn in the daytime. You'll never learn this with a crowd of 600 employees in the daytime. You'll never look at this and see it with 2,000 at church at Trinity on Sunday morning. But sometimes God will isolate you in a place of service to Him. And you'll think that nobody knows where you are. Nobody knows what you're going through. But you'll find out that you and God walking together, keeping the faith, holding on to the promises of the Word of God, that you will begin to be educated. And my, 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 only at night does that start story open to the believer. Only at night does the bell ring to start that classroom. 
Only at night does that fellowship happen that he'll walk with you through the midnight hour and be the personal instructor for what you're going through and what you're facing, never to leave you and never to abandon you. You see, ladies and gentlemen, it's in the dark that that lesson is learned. You'll never see it. You'll never learn it in the sunshine. So you bless the Lord where you are and you be faithful. And what did he say to do in verse number two? He said, and when it's dark and you're serving me, he said, just praise me. Just lift up your hands and praise me. You say, but Brother Ralph, it's dark. Nobody can see me. Are you doing it to be seen? Are you doing it because you love him? Hey, he said, just raise up those little hands and tell me you love me. And while you got those hands up, he said, I'll hug your neck. I'll embrace you. I'll comfort you. And hey, and in the dark, while you don't know who's beside you, you can't see. But when you raise those hands up and you got your candle and you got your lantern, why 20 feet away from you may be somebody and they're in a darker hole than you are. And they see your light come up. And they hear your voice say, I praise you, God. I don't understand everything, but I praise you, God, for who you are. God, I'm running out of juice. I low on the spiritual battery side. But God, as long as there's a little juice inside of my soul, I'm going to praise you and I'm going to thank you because you could have left me dead, broken on the side of the road. But you didn't do that, oh holy God. You saved me and you redeemed me and now I will praise you. Whether in the daytime or whether at the midnight hour, I'm going to lift up my light. And I'm going to serve him in the dark. Worship the Lord in the night. He said, lift up your hands in the sanctuary. You say, but wait a minute, Brother Ralph. I'm supposed to lift up my hands? Do you think tonight you're the only one in the dark? Do you think tonight you're the only one in a battle? Do you think tonight you're the only one that's lonely? Do you think you're the only one tonight that's having a financial struggle? Do you think you're the only one tonight that got a bad report at the doctor and you're scared to face the rising of the sun and the rising of the moon because you're in your own fears? Do you think you're the only one in the dark? Why, they're all over the world. They're all over the town. They're all over the church. They're everywhere because why? We're just people. And God said, when you bring me glory and honor and you raise up your hands even in the dark, God said, I'll use you. I'll use you. You may be saying, but God, I don't want to work in the night. If you lift up your hands, God said, somebody's going to see you. And you'll not, they'll know that they're not deserted. You're not by yourself. You're not all alone. And it's going to be an encouragement to somebody because you were faithful even in the dark. Now, look at verse number three. Here's God's response in the night. The Lord that made heaven and earth bless thee out of Zion. Verse one and verse two are my responsibility. I got to praise him. I'm going to keep on serving him even at night. I don't understand it all. But verse 3 is God's response. And God said, I will bless you. Now who's going to bless me? He's the Lord that made heaven and earth. He is, there's three things you got to remember about him. Now he said, I like you. I like your spirit. You got your hands up. You can't even see where you're going. And you got your hands up blessing my name. You're loving me. You're trusting my word. You're hanging on to my promises. And this same God Almighty that made it all, he's number one, the creator of all things. He's the God that made it. He's the God that made the real estate you're walking on. He's the God that made the air you're breathing. He's the God that made the blood that's circulating through your veins. He's God large and in charge. And that same God said, number one, I am the creator. Number two, I am the controller. I will control what you go through. I will take care of you. And the third element is he is the comforter. Creator, controller, 
and comfort her. And boy, sometimes in the midnight hour, when you don't know if you're going to keep your mind because your world's been turned upside down, the plug has been pulled on your finances, and you don't know why your daughter's in the trouble she's in, or your grandson's out in the world, or your best friend's walking out on his wife and children, and you're thinking, what in the world's going on? You've got to have something to hold on to past your emotions. We're not looking for another emotional experience. We're looking for the sure foundation of the inerrant, infallible Word of God. And I know that Jehovah God that made me and made this world, He controls me. And that is phenomenal. And so for that reason, God said, you bless the Lord, you worship me, you stay faithful to me, and you encourage others. And when you do that, I'll turn right around and I'll bless you. Because he said, while you're helping someone else, I'll be helping you. And where's he going to bless them? He's going to bless them out of Jerusalem. I'm going to bless you out of Zion. And what, what is Zion? Uh, that's Jerusalem. And what's in Jerusalem? It's the temple. And where is the Shekinah glory? The presence of God. God saying, I'm going to bless you with a relationship no one else has. I'm going to bless you out of the temple. I'm going to bless you with my presence. And that's what he's given us tonight. When you come to church and you've been saved, the Lord abides in you and you abide in him and you've got that special relationship. Thank you for allowing me to speak to you for just a moment about our trip to the Holy Land. As you know, we've gone for many, many years studying together in the land of Israel. My dad made his first trip to the Holy Land in 1951. Can you imagine that? And we're still going to the Holy Land today. I want you to go with me. We're going October the 29th. You can get all the information of where we're going to go every single day, what we're going to see, what we're going to do. Just go to the website, call the 800 number on your screen. We will mail you the brochure. So call us today. Make sure you go by the website. We have a PDF file. You can download the entire brochure. Thank you for your time. If you have any questions, just don't hesitate to call. We'll be happy to answer those for you and for your family. God bless you, and thank you for your time today.